Well, hello. Um, this is Joshua Godsey. Thank you for thank you for uh, watching this video. I just want to share um, something that's really on my heart in a, in a really significant, strong way. Last night, um, if you're familiar with the International House of Prayer in Kansas City, they're having their One Thing Conference, annual conference. A uh, lot of people come to it. Four days, um, morning, afternoon, evening sessions, tons of stuff going on. Um, and so uh, it's been really neat. And I've been web streaming it from West Texas uh, where we live. And so <clears throat> last night, Francis Chan, who it has never been to the International, International House of Prayer, has never even known their leadership. He talked about it last night um, and was He's, he's not at all, you know, uh, familiar with them or whatever, but he was invited to speak this year, and I didn't know much about him, um, and so I was really excited to hear from him in that, in that uh, context and just to see what God had, and I, 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 at this point, um, after watching him last night and just entering into what he had to say, it may have been one of the most important messages I've ever listened to, and I was so, so blessed to watch it. Um, it just, it brought tears to my eyes at times. It made me laugh at times. The guy is so full of joy. He just, he reminds me of, he reminds me of my brothers, uh, Nathan, Daniel, Michael, uh, Jonathan, and Micah, all men of God. I've got five brothers and they're just, they're just like energized men of, of men of God. And uh, <laughs> I know that's going to make them laugh, but uh, Francis Chan was just has this energy and he's just like, he's got his arms on stage and he's on his knees and he's just, he's going crazy and, and he just has so much, but also he has such a precise and sensitive heart for truth and for the word of God. So man, listen to Francis Chan. Don't, I'm not promoting him as a man, but I'm promoting what he, his love for the Lord. And I, I don't want to promote a man, and I don't ever want to do that. But and, and he actually specifically talked about that. He talked about people walking away from the message, thinking about Jesus, not thinking about the speaker. And amen to that. I mean, I, I just, but I love the Bible says to to esteem highly those who are working to preach the gospel. Um, Paul said that. I don't even remember where, but it's in the Bible. So read the Bible. And that brings me to the message that Francis shared. He, he said. The Word of God. The Word of God is how we meet Jesus. And we want to meet Jesus. So read this thing over and over and over and over and over and over again. Um, <clears throat> and most importantly, I want to, and, and the message is, is not just that, but I want to give you some scriptures that he shared, and I just want to give you my heart for it. Um, starting in 2 Timothy chapter 4, I charge you, verse 1, I charge you in the presence of God. This is Paul talking to Timothy. And of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word, and be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching. But having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions, and they will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. But as for you... Timothy, a man of God, someone after the Lord's heart, uh, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, and do the work of an evangelist and fulfill your ministry. So, such an important thing because here's what Francis Chan said, and I want to say to you, people are going to lie to you. People are going to tell you lies, I promise you. In fact, you might have people telling you lies all the time, regularly. And he said that last night, and I just was, it, it struck me with such a profound, um, it, just, it was just profound to me, because oftentimes the Word of God, and this is, this is talking about it, Christians, we're talking about people after truth, they're not only going to, <coughs> excuse me, I've been having a cold this morning, and so I've got a bunch of junk in my system, so forgive me, but um, not only... Are people going to come up with uh, with the things that are just untruthful and they're going to say lies, but they're actually going to find teachers that are going to tell them lies based on things that they want to hear. Man, and, and he kind of went through some practical examples like, oh, you know, I want to date this girl and she's not really into God that much, but, I, you know, who, you know, what is this? And, you know, 
it says to not be yoked to an unbeliever, but, you know, I don't know about that. And, like, and then you can take that to the extent of, like, you know, you're married for a while and everything's going badly now. And it's like, well, Jesus said it's, it's our hard-heartedness and it's our sins that cause divorce. But, I mean, really, what did it mean? And, like, you can just, you can interpret this thing. And he was like, <laughs> Francis was just like, read this book and, and trust this book. I want to know Jesus. I want to know the truth. I want to know the word. And I love this book. And he, he talked about um, he talked about just the life and the joy of being uh, in the Word. And I and I just want to encourage you. you. You may not have seen Francis last night, and so I wanted to share on my blog a little bit of my personal testimony. <coughs> Forgive me. Excuse me. A little bit of my testimony about the Word because I have definitely been through times where I remember there was a friend of mine. And we were kind of starting to, we had been, we had been together in ministry and then we kind of started to think differently. And it, <coughs> it kind of came, came to a head. And unfortunately, because of my intense immaturity and my sin, I found myself one day, it's my hard heartedness. I, I, I just, I've repented to him actually since this day. But I found myself reading the Bible going, yeah, yeah, this is what he's doing wrong. And this is, this is what I'm saying. And I'm like reading through the Bible. I think I was reading through, um, I was reading through like Ephesians or something. And I'm reading through it and I'm like, this, this is, he's not getting this. He's not getting this, you know. And I found myself like, I'm reading the word of God in order to, to just like strike down my brother. And it's, it's like, how wicked am I right now? <laughs> It's like, how judgmental am I being right now, you know? And I knew at the time it was not good. Um, and so that, that's, a, that's a danger in our heart to, to use the Word of God in the wrong way. But here's a testimony about the Word of God for me in, in, in a good way. Is, is lately, uh, I've decided to read Genesis 1 all the way to Revelation 22, book cover to cover. And I've read the Bible. I've, I've re been reading the Bible for a long time, even though I'm totally not disciplined in it. But... Um, I've, been, I've read it, you know, because I've it's raised a Christian, so that helps. That puts some time, but a lot of most of the time, it's been undisciplined, not really getting the message, not 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 reading it with with the right, you know, interpretation. In other words, reading it for what it is in its context, not using verses like I was doing with my friend, using these verses to attack him. I mean, it's like that's not the context. The context of Ephesians is building up the body in the church of Ephesians, and you know, it's like okay, anyway, so. But I'm reading it now. <coughs> Pardon me. And I'm reading the... And so I'm into... Right now I'm into uh, Nehemiah. So I've read through books like Leviticus and 1st 2nd Kings, 1st 2nd Chronicles, things like that. And I'm telling you, there's so much life and joy in, in those passages. And, and there's, some, there's some points of it that are really difficult. And, and so Francis Chan last night blew my mind because I told my wife, I leaned over and I was like, Oh my goodness. Because what happened was he was on stage in this conference, 30,000 30, people, and he preached out of 1 Kings 15 and out of Amos chapter 7. And if you go right now and you read those passages, um, and, he, and the other one was in, there's a third one that was in 1 Kings as well, and I forget which chapter. The first one was the story of the man of God. Many of you may not even remember this if you've read it, um, but he's sitting by a tree, and there's a whole context of the story, but to make it short, He's sitting under a tree, and the Lord has called him to be in fasting right now. But a guy comes to him and says, hey, and this guy under the tree is a prophet. So a second guy comes up and says, hey, Mr. Prophet, come home with me, and I want to feed you and give you drink. And, um, and so <clears throat> the guy is like, well, no, thank you, but <clears throat> he basically summarizes and says, the Lord has called me to not specifically not eat bread and to not drink because I'm under a time of, I mean, that's just the command of the Lord. While I'm in this area, that's what I'm going to do. And the guy's like, no, no, no. I'm, the second guy says, I'm a prophet just like you. And an angel came to me and told me, go and tell him to come to your house and eat and drink. And so the guy's like, the first guy's like, okay, I guess, you know. And so he goes with him and he eats and he drinks in his home. And then he leaves and on his way, the Lord speaks to him and says, because you didn't listen to the word of the Lord, um, disaster is basically coming. And so on his way, a lion comes and kills him. And it's, it's just like super like, what? What is going on? You know, it's almost one of those stories where you're just like, what is this? Is, I mean, what is going on? And, and 
I love that Francis Chan brought that up because it's so important to understand that the word of the Lord, God is <clears throat> looking for those who are after his heart and men will lie to you. And, and you know, actually something Francis didn't bring up that I kind of thought would have been important last night is the guy who got eaten by the lion, luckily he can look forward to a resurrection. Amen. I mean, isn't that true? We, death is not the end of the story. So even though it's, it's, it's a horrible thing that he was attacked by and killed by a lion, that's not the end of the story. And so it, it causes a lot less of offense towards these scriptures. Um, <clears throat> anyways, so, and then the second story is, this one, this one is just super intense. It's so, it's so intense. Uh, learning about what, who Jesus really is, um, and, uh, who, who God really is. Uh, king Jeroboam was the king of Judah. At this time, Judah and Israel are two separate entities because of division. And then they have King, uh, Ahab. And you, you, you probably have heard those guys' names, and Ahab's the king of Israel. And uh, Ahab's going to battle, and he says, let's do this thing, and he, and he asks for Jeroboam's help. And at this time, Jer Israel and Judah were actually kind of cooperating together. And uh, so Jeroboam's like, yeah, I'll help you if you seek the prophets to ask if the Lord is with you in this battle. They're going to Ram Ramoth Gilead, and uh, Ramoth Gilead, whatever you say, however you say it. Um, and so he's like, okay, you know, so let's seek the prophets. All these 400 prophets come, and they all say, King Ahab, you are going to have success. And Jeroboam's like, okay, hold on. Did you call Micaiah or something? I forget the name of it. There's one of these prophets. And he's like, did you ask that guy? Because you asked these 400, but did you ask him, this other one? And uh, Ahab is like, no. He, and I didn't because every time he prophesies against me. You know, and, and you guys remember Ahab, Jezebel is Ahab's wife at this point. Jezebel is like one of the most wicked creatures. Um, people in the entire Bible. Ahab has kind of been back and forth with God. He's done some really bad things. And then he's sh shown some, some good things in the past. But anyway, he says this one prophet always says bad things about me. I don't want to ask him. Jeroboam's like, you should ask him. So he comes and brings that one prophet. It's like Micah or Micah or something like that. So let's say Micah, even though, well, I don't want to do that because it's inaccurate. But anyway, this prophet comes and says, um, and they're like, what do you say? And the prophet says, yeah, you're going to have success. And then Ahab goes, are you telling me the truth? And, and then he kind of presses him. And the prophet actually goes, if you want to know the truth, this is what the Lord, word of the Lord is. I saw the heavens and I saw the Lord declare disaster over Ahab. And I said to myself, how can I entice Ahab into being destroyed? And a in spirit, it said that spirits gathered to him, and one said this, and the other said this. But one spirit came up to God and said, I will do this. And God says, well, how will you do this? And he said, I will go to all of the prophets of God, and I will get, be a deceiving spirit to them, so that we can destroy Ahab. And God is like, you will do that, and you will be successful in it. And this, so the spirit goes out and, and gives a lying spirit to all the prophets, 400 plus prophets, to King Ahab. And so the, the correct prophet, the one who's saying this, says, that's the word of the Lord. And Ahab is like, no way, that's not true. And he goes out and sure enough, he's destroyed and he's killed. He actually tries to dress up in secret so that no one would know who he was, the actual king of Israel. He dresses in secret and it just so happens that an arrow is shot and gets him right in the armor and kills him. And it's like, what? What is going on? You know, like, we, we don't like to think of God as a, as a God of wrath, but like, I read this book and that's what it says. You know what I mean? Like, we are sons of wrath, according to Ephesians. I mean, we can turn there. Uh, listen to this. He says, uh, let me find this. Let me find here. Okay, Ephesians 2. And you were dead in your trespasses and sin and once you walked, and once you, in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. 
The point is, though, this Bible told me that God is going to pour out wrath on those who sin against Him. You know what I mean? I know that that's not fun. I know that's not easy to hear. But that's what this book says. And so, like, you're just, you're, your choice is whether you're going to read this book or you're going to listen to people who are lying to you. And I'm just, I'm so provoked by that because it's so good. And I, I want to know Jesus. And I believe that you do too. And I believe that all of us Christians should have a burning desire to know Jesus. To, to understand His love for us. That He died for us. To study this man who loved us so much that He came and He said, I want to be like them so I can, so I can understand what they go through. In every respect, He understands every trial we go through. And He suffered and He died on the cross to carry and sanctify our sins for in all the sins of the world because He loved us so much. I want to know this man. And I want to actually... What the, what, I want to actually share in his sufferings as a way of understanding his heart for me and for everyone else that I might actually attain to a better resurrection because we know the end, the end of the story. We don't, we don't walk for this life in this age. The end of the story is a resurrection of my body. If I die, I'm going to live forever. You know what I mean? So I actually want to be a companion of Jesus in his sufferings and in his difficulties because it's ultimately in his joy. It's for the joy that was set before him that he endured the cross. It's because he's going to be re- he was resurrected as a first, the first one to be resurrected to prove that all of us will be resurrected. That's what this Bible says. That's what it says. You know, I want to know what this says. I don't want to know what man says. I don't want to know what some guy said because they're going to deceive me unless they're preaching the word in season, out of season, and they're doing it the way that the Lord intended it to be done, like in 2 Timothy chapter 4 because we all know we want to form things in our own way if we want that girlfriend if we want that divorce or you know for me there's many things that I do if I want to puff myself up and look make myself look good if I want to sound like I'm really smart if I want to be successful and, and convince businessmen to 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 like me and to let me do you know let me work with them so I can make money whatever it is I mean uh, we, we like to form things that help us and kind of puff ourselves up and, and build, build what we want and what we desire. You know, we don't want to listen to the Sermon on the Mount where it says, men, if you even think about a woman in an inappropriate way, it's as if you actually did it. And we don't want to think about that stuff a lot of times, you know. But going to the Sermon on the Mount, I just want to end with this. Uh, it says, this is the... This is the this is Jesus talking, and this is what I'm talking about. I want to do what the Bible says, and specifically what Jesus says. He says, everyone who hears these words of mine, and this is the, this is the ending of the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. If you know any scripture in your life, Matthew 5, 6, and 7, those are the ones to do. Then he finishes chapter 7 saying, everyone who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain fell, you know, suffering, difficulty, doubt, persecution, loss, death, everything that's, te- that's bad, that's difficult, depression, self-hatred, getting broke, you know, having disaster happen, whatever. The rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it didn't fall because it had been founded on the rock. There's only one rock, and that's Jesus Christ, the supreme being. Colossians 1, everything was made by Him, for Him, and through him, what it's all unto him and for him, and he he partners with us. He is the creator. I mean, if we could, Francis said this last night. If I could rip open the roof of this building and of heaven itself, and I could observe this creature, this this he's not even a creature. He's an uncreated God, and I could see him who dwells in inapproachable light. And if a man could see him, the Bible says he would actually instantly die because of his glory and his holiness. Oh, if you take a deep breath, take a deep breath right now. It's on His grace that I was able to even take that breath. He sustains my life. He even sustains my breath. Psalm 104 talks in detail how he, He actually orchestrates the wind, the streams in the mountains. He actually feeds animals through His own processes. We call them, we call it nature. And some who are foolish call it Mother Nature. It's actually God. And this is Jesus doing this. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does them, and does not do them, rather, uh, verse 26, will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. 
and the rains fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell and great was the fall of it. And so anyways, I just want to share with you out of my heart to read this book, the most precious times of my life. And this is what Francis said last night. And I totally, totally loved it and burned with the same fire. The most precious times of my life were in the secret place. And where Matthew 5, 6, 7 talks about this, this door back here behind me. I come in here and I shut that door and I draw the curtains and I pray in here and I have time with the word. And it's the most precious time of my life. Remember, if you've been a Christian for a long time, Revelation chapter 3, he talks to the church of Sardis, you have a reputation for being holy and, and burning after me, but, in, but I know you and you are cold. Remember the fact that you had your first love and what it was like when you had your first love. And Francis ended his message last night with that, with that and it just pierced my heart. I thought about my wife, Mandy, and I thought about my life in the Lord. I think about how the longer I do this thing, the more it's difficult to remember that honeymoon period, to remember the, those intimate feelings, those, I'll do anything. I'll do anything for you, God. I'll, 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 who, who cares about a car? Who cares about a house? You know, if I have clothes on my back, I'll be content. I mean, it's that kind of heart to know the Word. I just encourage you, if you've been a Christian for years, and if you've never been a Christian and you've just come to the Lord, you probably have this feeling more than I do. And I want to get it back. I want to remember my first love. Get in the secret place. And, and the final thing I'll say is I remember in the worst times of my life when I was going through some tough stuff um, in college, just identity crisis, etc. I remember, in, it's, it's really silly, and, and a lot of you are going to kind of chuckle at this, but in the shower, I remember always saying, Lord, I don't have a desire for your word right now, but I pray that you will give me one. Give me a desire for your word. Give me a desire. And that's exactly what I'm, I encourage you to do. If you don't have a desire for the secret place to be in the word and in prayer and in fasting, pray for it. Start there. I mean, that's the, that's the, that's the first place because I know we're weak and we get tired, sleepy. I'm, I'm feeling sick today. I, all those things. But stick with it. Pray for it. And the grace of the Lord Jesus will come and fill your life. Believe it. He, he does it. I'm telling you. He is faithful. He's knocking on the door. If we will seek Him, He will answer us. Because He's seeking us a thousand times more than we're seeking Him. So seek Him in the private place, in the secret place of your heart. The most pleasure you will have in this age is in the secret place of your heart, in His Word, getting to know Him with the words that He said about Himself. Don't trust anything else. Trust the words that He said about Himself. Amen.